Thank you for joining this episode of UAB Medicine's post-COVID Lunch and Learn series. Today, Dr. Shruti Agnihotri, Associate Professor in the Department of Neurology, will be discussing neurologic complications with post-COVID syndrome. Please submit your questions in the Q&A, and if time allows, at the end of today's presentation, Dr. Agnihotri will try to answer as many questions as possible that relate to this Lunch and Learn. For those of you new to Zoom, you will find the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. I will pass this over to Dr. Agnihotri. Dr. Agnihotri. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I hope everyone is doing well. It is my privilege today to talk to you all about neurologic complications in post-COVID syndrome. So this is part of our post-COVID webinar series, and some of you may have already heard before from Dr. Overton and Dr. Perry, um, who talked about COVID, post-COVID syndrome, as well as signs and symptoms with the cardiovascular system and COVID. And today I'm going to talk to you about the neurologic complications uh, seen in post-COVID patients. So we'll talk a little bit about what COVID-19 and the common symptoms are. We will also talk about neurologic complications seen in early COVID-19. We will then move on to talk a little bit about patients who have had severe COVID-19 and the types of neurologic complications they can experience. We'll focus a lot more on the post-COVID um, symptoms, neurologic complications. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll touch base a little bit about some of the common questions that get asked in our clinic um, related to neurologic complications in post-COVID patients. So what is COVID-19 and the kind of symptoms that we see? Um, most of you probably know this and are familiar that COVID-19 is the disease that is caused by this novel coronavirus. It's called SARS-CoV-2, that's the name of the virus. It's called, a, it's a type of a coronavirus and the coronavirus is a big family of viruses and it's called corona because the shape under the microscope, it looks like a crown and crown means corona in Latin. It is highly contagious disease and know that coronaviruses can cause many, they're common, they cause, you know, there are a lot of different types of coronaviruses that cause common cold. Um, this one just is a little bit different in that it causes many different complications um, as well. Some of the common symptoms that are seen with COVID-19 when somebody gets this early on include fever, cough, often a dry cough to start with, then a more, then there is some phlegm production, fatigue, difficulty breathing, chills, headache, those are all very common initial symptoms of COVID-19. So when somebody gets COVID-19 in early stage of the disease, they can have a lot of symptoms that are neurologic in origin. Um, headache is a very, very common early complaint. The headache does not necessarily have any specific characteristic. They could be like any other headache. Sometimes patients tell us it feels like a sinus headache. For some patients that headache can be very disabling. So a new headache, a headache that is different than the usual headaches that they've ever had. Loss of taste and loss of smell can also be an early symptom. Um, and we'll talk about these as to how some of these symptoms can then persist or go on for longer in patients with post-COVID syndrome. You have probably heard, you know, a lot of these anecdotes of healthcare workers initially waiting, you know, like trying the first morning coffee and see if they smell that or not. So loss of smell and loss of taste is a little bit peculiar to this virus. Um, it can be seen in other viruses as well, um, but that is one of the initial, common initial symptoms. This graph tells you or describes the rate of complications. 
So about 94% of patients will have some neurologic complaint as part of their early or initial COVID-19. Dizziness can be seen in about 8% or 16 to up to, up to 16% of patients. Headaches are very, very common. As you see here, headaches can be seen anywhere between 45 to 80% of patients will have headache as their initial symptom associated with COVID-19. Loss of smell and loss of taste, they often go together, but sometimes patients can have one or the other. And that ranges anywhere from around 55% to around 90% of patients who can have either loss of smell or loss of taste or both. Muscle pain as in, you know, just, just body aches and muscle pain are also very common. And that can be seen in up to 57 to 63% of patients. Nerve pain with either some tingling or just some burning pain can sometimes be seen in patients with COVID-19. And this pain can be anywhere in the limbs, anywhere in the arms or legs. There are few patients who, for various reasons, may go on to then develop complications or what's called severe COVID-19. Severe COVID-19 usually refers to patients who develop respiratory or breathing difficulties, and they may often need to be admitted in the hospital, need oxygen, or, and sometimes even be need to be put on a ventilator or a breathing machine. And so those patients tend to have more severe neurologic complications. So when they survive, when these patients survive the severe COVID-19, they can develop memory loss. They can have a brain fog. Brain fog refers to just sort of cloudiness or slowness in their thinking process or frank confusion as well. These are very common neurologic complications in patients who have had severe COVID-19. Some of the more worrisome or severe neurologic complications, thankfully tend to be rare in these patients, but they can occur. And when they occur, they can cause a lot of trouble down the road. So they often leave patients with significant problems down the road, have caused a lot of disability in patients as well. So some of these ones include things like strokes. Stroke means often means, you know, there's a blood clot that goes to the brain and that can cause um, complications that can lead sometimes to paralysis on one side of the body that can sometimes affect speech um, and can affect swallowing and things like that. Uh, some patients, again, it's a rare complication, but some patients who may have epilepsy can have worsening or breakthrough seizures. Seizures mean convulsions. For some others, the new, this can be a new onset. So they can develop for the first time in their life, they can develop seizures or epilepsy. The the last one here listed is confusion, delirium, and encephalopathy. Those are sort of used interchangeably. Those are terms that are used interchangeably. And that can also occur in patients who have had severe COVID-19, who've been on a breathing tube and a ventilator for a long time. What this refers to is that normally the process is that when patients are put on a, on a breathing machine, they often... Are, are, are on medicines that induce a coma. So they are in a medically induced coma. As the medicines are stopped, one would expect the patients to start waking up and then we look to see if they can breathe what their lungs are doing. What we have seen in patients with severe COVID-19 is that the patients have take a really long time to wake up after the medications have been held or have been paused. That just refers to the state of the brain where the brain is still so severely affected with the severe COVID-19 that it has a hard time doing what it is supposed to do, which is wake up, you know, follow directions and understand what's going on 
around you. And that's, that's difficult for patients when they have had such severe COVID-19. These are the kind of complications that we worry about. These, as I said earlier, can lead to devastating problems down the road and sometimes may mean that recovery is hard or sometimes not possible. So who are the patients who are at risk for such severe neurologic complications? Again, not everyone gets this. This is in a certain patient population where it can lead to severe complications when they have had severe COVID-19. And this is similar to saying who is at risk for having severe COVID-19. So patients generally, usually age greater than 65, those who are obese, um, those who have diabetes, those who have had high blood pressure, those who have had heart disease, heart attacks before, patients who smoke, and those who have their immune system suppressed because they are on certain medications, sometimes because they're on chemotherapy, sometimes because they have had transplant and they are on certain medications. So all those patients are thought to be at high risk for developing neurologic complications if they develop severe COVID-19. So now moving on to what we want to talk about or really focus on today is the post-COVID-19. So this we are talking about patients who have developed COVID-19 and continue to have symptoms down the road. So you've probably heard and seen, you know, in, in the media, in newspapers, a lot of different places, different words and different terminology that have been used for the same kind of patient population. Um, so, you know, this was initially kind of coined by patients themselves who call themselves long haulers. Uh, that refers to like, you know, uh, truck drivers, right? Who, who kind of continue driving really long distances. The other term that is often used is long COVID or post-COVID syndrome, a terminology that NIH has come up with, um, sort of a long name here, but it's called PASC, P-A-S-C, which says post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So you may hear me use some of these terms interchangeably today, but that's what we are referring to when we talk about post-COVID. So how, what exactly is post-COVID? What do we mean when we say post-COVID? So think of COVID-19 in different stages. So the first stage is acute COVID-19, where somebody will have symptoms. And I, I talked a little bit earlier about how neurologic symptoms can be seen in this stage. Symptoms usually last for up to four weeks after they have been infected or after the start of the first symptom. Some patients will continue to remain symptomatic, meaning that some of their initial symptoms may get better, the fever may improve, the chills may improve, but some of the other symptoms like headache or body ache or fatigue may continue. And we would put that in this term of ongoing symptomatic COVID-19. And that period is anywhere between four to 12 weeks. When we use the term post-COVID, we usually refer to the illness continuing beyond 12 weeks so that the signs and symptoms have developed soon after they first got the initial symptoms of COVID-19, but sometimes can also develop subsequently or after that initial symptom, but that those symptoms have continued beyond 12 weeks. And that you know, these symptoms cannot be explained by other diagnosis. So that's what we are looking to call as post-COVID. So what are the neurologic symptoms that we are seeing in these post-COVID patients? And these are pretty, pretty common neurologic symptoms. Headaches, as I told you earlier, the headaches can start soon after they have first got the COVID infection, but then continue for quite a bit after that. The headaches can be in many different ways. For some patients who already have a known history of headaches or migraines, meaning that they've had them before, 
the COVID may exacerbate and the post COVID may just mean that they now have a really bad flare up and they continue to have worse and severe migraines or headaches. The usual medicines that they use for their headaches no longer work for them, meaning that they may need to do some other things or may need to use other medications to help with these headaches. The headache can be in one side or the other. Some patients describe the headache as being in the back of the eye. For some, the headache can be in the back part of the head as well. These headaches can sometimes be associated, meaning they often go together with nausea. Some patients describe it as a true migraine where lights and sound also bother them when they get a severe headache and they would prefer to go and lie down. Um, the other common neurologic symptom and that one that can often be associated with other symptoms as well is what's called COVID somnia, which refers to the sleep disturbances that patients get. The sleep disturbances can vary. So for some patients, that means that they are so tired and so fatigued that they want to sleep all day. Whereas for others, it also means that they are not able to fall asleep. So we see this sort of two patterns and often in one patient, the pattern may change from one to the other, where initially they often have a lot of fatigue and will complain that all they did was just sleep all day and all night. Eventually that progresses to where they have great difficulty falling asleep. And if they do fall asleep, they are often awakened and unable to fall back asleep. For some other patients, the cycle sort of reverses where there is, where they have a lot more sleep during, during daytime, but then they don't sleep as well during nighttime. One other complaint that, you know, you probably all, a lot of you may have heard is something called brain fog. Brain fog is usually a term that patients use, and it can mean many different things for different patients. Um, what we see in our clinic is that patients will complain of forgetfulness, forgetting like a short-term memory loss. Um, they find themselves sometimes repeating conversations. They find themselves going into a room and forget why they went to the room or what they were going to do. Patients who previously were able to multitask or do some really complex or difficult cognitive tasks now find themselves having difficulty doing that, that they need to really focus hard and concentrate to do something, but that if their mind is distracted or if they are kind of pulled in different directions, they have a really hard time completing a task or staying focused. Um, you know, some patients will describe how, if they have, for whatever reason, if they have gotten, let's say, chemotherapy before, they will come and relate it to us and say that this feels exactly like a chemo brain, similar to what they had after chemotherapy. Some patients describe symptoms being very similar to what they may have experienced after a concussion. So like a post-concussive post -concussive syndrome. Um, the other common complaint is fatigue. Um, fatigue seems like a pretty vague symptom. Uh, what patients often describe is that no matter what they do, they just feel very tired or that they have to end their day sooner because they cannot carry on doing what they would normally. Um, and this is a pretty important complaint because it affects the quality of life for so many of our patients. And as I said earlier, all of these symptoms, the headache, the sleep disturbance, the brain fog, the fatigue, they often tend to run together. And sometimes it's hard to say as to what is leading to what other symptom. It's, it's sort of like the chicken and the egg analogy. Is it because somebody has poor sleep? 
is that why is that what leads to headache because we do know that headaches can be triggered when the sleep is poor or is it the headaches that keep patients up similarly is the fatigue somebody is not able to do their daily activities or perform their tasks like they would be able to is fatigue because of the sleep or is fatigue playing a role in causing patients to be you know tired and sleep a lot more so it's a little bit hard to sort out as to what leads to which one and that is something that i i hope future research will shine some more light on some of the other common post covid neurologic symptoms that we continue to see is patients have ongoing loss of smell sensation so for some it is loss of smell but for some others it can also mean abnormal smell patients often come and tell us that they smell burning or smoke when there is nothing there and often times they have gotten up looked around the whole house making sure nothing was burning had to ask somebody else and the other person said i don't smell anything this is what we often refer to as a phantosmia which is like this abnormal smell that tends to improve with time uh, but this is something that we certainly see in some of our patients the taste sensation so altered taste or loss of taste sensation often continues for a while for some of our patients dizziness and fatigue is another symptom that can continue and the dizziness can mean different things for different patients for some patients the dizziness refers to a feeling of lightheadedness a feeling like they are going to pass out for others the dizziness also means a sensation of being off balance like they are going to fall very few patients have a true vertigo or a spinning sensation tingling and numbness um in arm or leg sometimes that moves around it doesn't always have to be in one arm and one leg all the time um something that often moves around or spreads is also a common post covid neurologic symptom some patients develop or continue to have ongoing muscle pain and some patients will develop muscle weakness as well some of the more common symptoms that we have seen are what we call neuropsychiatric symptoms so mood changes and anxiety are very very common um accompaniments often to these symptoms suddenly everyone has been through a lot in this past year that can be the trigger for anxiety or mood changes the possibility of not knowing what is going on um with their symptoms or why they continue to have headaches also can be the cause of these anxiety and mood changes what we see often is that when a patient has significant anxiety or depression that tends to make their neurologic symptoms worse um there is a condition that we call functional neurologic disorder which refers to neurologic symptoms that can be triggered purely because of anxiety depression or sometimes for other reasons um those refer to disorders where there are neurologic signs and symptoms but that they are primarily not because of any abnormal electrical activity or not because of abnormal sort of mri changes and such those you know usually these symptoms we we work very closely with our psychiatry team to help manage these symptoms together our neurology team and our psychiatry team will work together to help manage these symptoms so i'll 
address some of the frequently asked questions in, in my clinic to hopefully kind of, you know, maybe give everyone a little bit of insight as to how, what, what to do about these different symptoms. So the common question asked is, you know, how common, right? How common are these neurologic complications in post-COVID? Am I the only one? Do you see this often? I get that question asked a lot. And as you see here, you know, this was a study done in patients who had, this, this was a post-COVID, so very similar to our clinic. These are patients who come into a post-COVID neuro clinic and, you know, they were evaluated to see what they have. And these were their common complaints. So brain fog is a very, very common complaint. A lot of patients who come to the neurologic post-COVID clinic have the symptom of brain fog. Similarly, headaches, numbness, tingling, the abnormal taste and smell, all those are very, very common complaints. Um, so to answer the question of am I alone, you know, unfortunately, no, right? The answer is most patients do tend to have these complaints. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about what they mean. So the other question that is often asked is, is this permanent, right? Is this how I will be forever? I have this brain fog. I find it very hard to function in my day-to-day -day activities. You know, does this mean that this is how it is going to be for the rest of my life? We certainly do not have enough research to say that with certainty, but with what we know and what we have seen so far, we feel that it is unlikely that this is going to be permanent. We have certainly seen patients who improve with time and with other measures. And from, from a biologic or mechanistic perspective, at least at this time, there is not much to say that this will lead or is this going to progress to dementia? We, we really don't think so. Most patients tend to improve with time and with modifications to the lifestyle. So some, uh, another question that is asked is, does this mean that the virus, the SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus, is that in my brain? Is it residing? Is it permanently fixed in my brain? So studies have shown that the virus is actually not present in the brain in any large or meaningful numbers. It definitely tends to go in you know, your breathing system, your respiratory system and the lungs. But if it has been identified in the brain, it is in very small or very minuscule amount or numbers. So we don't think that the virus itself is causing troubles or damage in the brain. We really think that the neurologic complications are occurring primarily because of inflammation related to the virus or for other reasons in how that virus affects your body, but not because of the virus itself in the brain. So the other question that is often asked is, does this mean, you know, do I need a brain MRI? Um, does everyone, you know, if I have any neurologic complaint, does that mean that I need a brain MRI? So an MRI of the brain, you know, is a scan that helps us, you know, that gives us a very good or a detailed image of your brain. And we make that decision based on the symptoms and largely based on what we find on our exam. We can certainly tell you based on our clinic experience, as well as what has been reported in the studies, in the literature, like I told you, one of the big post-COVID clinic studies that has been out, most patients who complain of having a brain fog or headache, they tend to have a normal MRI. Um, so for most patients, we do not find anything worrisome on the brain MRI. As bothersome as these complaints are, <clears throat> we do not find anything worrisome on, on the scan. So what do we do to manage uh, symptoms for most patients? 
And here are some of the things that patients can do at home by themselves, which is, you know, hydrate with water. Um, patients forget sometimes, um, you know, we're just so busy doing what we're doing that we forget how much water we need. I think one of my first recommendations to anybody who has headache is that increase the water intake um, and see if that helps some. Correction of any sleep disturbance. Um, there's something that we call sleep hygiene. And part of sleep hygiene includes, you know, avoiding screen, so not doing any kind of screen, whether that is TV or phone in the bed, not eating or reading in the bed. Part of it is training your brain to say that the bed is meant for sleeping. Um, no heavy exercise later in the afternoon or evening, really reducing the caffeine intake. Um, so caffeine, you know, use some caffeine in the early morning, that's okay. But you really want to reduce the caffeine intake later, like afternoon, you really do not want any caffeine. A healthy diet, so more, you know, avoiding carbohydrates, more fruits and vegetables in the diet um, have been shown to be beneficial and are helpful for most patients. Some form of regular exercise. I tell my patients, you really want to start at least by doing simple walking. Um, that can be helpful as well. It sounds counterintuitive as to what would a physical thing of exercise have to do with headache or brain fog. Um, we know from other studies, we know from studies in other patients like those with chronic fatigue syndrome and such that exercise is very beneficial and helpful. And then last, but definitely not the least, something that we focus on very heavily is anxiety and stress management. Um, as I said earlier, we do think that a lot of our patients tend to have anxiety and stressors and sort of identifying them, identifying that some of your body symptoms could be related to those stressors and anxiety is helpful. And working on some of the stress management techniques is also very helpful. So I think with that, I will um, end my talk and my um, kind of slides here. And I will take uh, questions that may have come in. Thank you, Dr. Agnihotri. Um, so we'll start with the Q&A portion. Um, first question, what should my next steps be if brain fog continues to persist after a month of COVID? Right. And I think, you know, I would initially I would focus on um, some of the techniques that we discussed a little bit ago, which includes hydration, trying to see if sleep can be improved. Is sleep a factor? Um, trying to see you know, is there anxiety or stress? Is that what is worsening? Using some techniques, alternative techniques like um, meditation and mindfulness, which help improve concentration and focus um, are also important and can be helpful. So second question, please talk about COVID-induced delirium. Right, so COVID-induced delirium refers to, if you see one of my earlier slides about um, encephalopathy or delirium or confusion. That is usually seen in patients who have had severe COVID-19. So those are patients um, who are often admitted to the hospital and they develop a, a very frank confusion. So something that is very different for them they've never had that before, um, get very disoriented. We see that more commonly in patients who are elderly or patients who have had, or who have dementia or even sometimes the beginnings of dementia, and then they develop COVID-19. Um, I think if somebody were to have a COVID-19 induced delirium, I would definitely advise those patients or their family members to get a medical evaluation to understand and help sort out what's going on. 
Question three, are there any treatment options that do not involve heavy side effects from medications? Absolutely. And I think we, you know, we tend to, as, as you saw from my presentation earlier, there aren't actually any specific medications that we use. We try to manage all the different symptoms just based on as much as we can with non-medical management. Um, and that includes, again, the same things, um, hydration, um, focusing on drinking plenty of water, focusing on uh, you know, sleep hygiene and um, anxiety, stress management. So yes, I think a lot can be done by using some of these other techniques. Why are my damaged olfactory neurons still affecting my sense of smell? Yes. Um, so olfactory neurons are the, they are the kind of, they are the nerves that start in the nose or the back of the nose and they take the signals of smell to the brain. And that is how brain recognizes the sense of smell. And you're right, those have been shown to be affected in COVID-19, um, which is why that loss of smell is often an early and initial symptom with COVID-19. For a lot of patients, it improves with time and that sense of smell returns. But for some others, that abnormal smell or loss of smell continues for a while. And I think those are... Um, we've certainly seen that that improves with time. It is a little bit difficult to treat, but we do work with our um, ENT folks for a few patients where it persists beyond, um, you know, a few months. Is getting lost while driving or in an office building for a minute or two a symptom of COVID? Yes, and I think that is very much what, our patients with brain fog describe um, that after they have recovered from COVID-19, they continue to have this brain fog where it's not that they are frankly confused. It's not something that just goes on and on, but it is brief. And in that moment, they feel lost or disoriented, but as they are able to focus again, they get more oriented and they know what's going on. So this person would like to know if you have learned anything about internal tremors some of us with long COVID are having. Yeah, um, that is something that we have certainly heard patients describe. Um, let me sort of clarify here that there can sometimes be two things. So one, one is a symptom that patients describe, that patients feel jittery or tremulous inside them something that cannot be seen on the outside. So if I were to examine that patient, I wouldn't see it. Um, that is often a common symptom of anxiety. Um, and that is something, that's how I would, I would view this symptom. The other part of that is sometimes patients can have tremors or tremors in the hands. And um, that can also be seen in some post-COVID patients. Are you seeing people impacted with vision issues post COVID? If so, what treatments or studies related to it are there? Um, yes, we have suddenly seen patients often in association with headache, but sometimes even without a headache where they will have complaints of blurred vision. Sometimes they feel that the, the, there's a, a, an image that moves and that it continues to move. Even when their eyes stop, the image lingers behind. Um, and I think, again, if it is something that comes and goes, it may not be as worrisome compared to something that's ongoing and just staying. And then that may need evaluation by an eye doctor. Why will my headaches not go away? Yeah, so headaches can be very persistent. Um, it is amongst the most common complaint that we see in our clinic. Um, and there can, you know, if, if you're somebody who's had a headache before and this is just a headache that is different or not going away, there can be, 
There can be medications that can be tried to help with headaches. We usually use the type of medications that one would use to treat other headaches or migraines. Um, one other common thing that we are finding is patients may have undiagnosed sleep apnea. Sleep apnea refers to where sometimes patients may stop breathing in their, in their sleep. It's for brief. Um, and that condition is not necessarily related to COVID. Sleep apnea is also a very common condition, often related to being obese. Um, so that may be one of the other things that we also look for in patients and try to evaluate. Is there anything that can be done for the brain fog slash cognitive issues encountered? Um, I think there can be, there are some what is called cognitive behavior therapy or sort of cognitive rehab, um, which includes and involves sort of techniques as to how to overcome or how to learn um, focus or what are the coping skills that can be done um, to overcome this lack of focus and lack of concentration. Is it common for neuro symptoms to come and go, such as in flare-ups? Um, for some patients, we have seen symptoms like tingling and numbness come in flare-ups. Um, for a majority of patients, though, they tend to occur kind of ongoing over the time period that they have had since COVID. Some patients do tend to get flare-ups of tingling and numbness. So you mentioned abnormal smells, but have you seen patients with abnormal taste? Certainly, certainly. Um, often patients describe a metallic taste. Some patients, thankfully few, but they do describe having kind of a really bad taste to the food that they eat um, to the point that it can affect their eating and how, how they can keep up with their nutrition. Um, have you seen paralysis in long haulers? Typically, we do not see paralysis um, in, in long COVID. Um, I think that if, if somebody has that, that would definitely need further evaluation. By paralysis, we typically mean weakness on, um, you know, on one limb or the other. So if there is a weakness that is generalized all throughout a component which is similar to fatigue, that is something that is seen more commonly. But if there is a complaint of weakness in one limb or the other, um, that would definitely merit an evaluation. So last question, if COVID-induced delirium, such as hallucinations and paranoia resolved on its own, might there be long-term effects that should be checked? Yeah, so um, I think that's a very good question and something that everyone is still studying to try and see what happens. You know, they, these patients may have had delirium, confusion when they were really sick. Those things improve. Sometimes these patients do not improve back to their previous baseline, meaning that they continue to have still some cognitive troubles. Um, what happens to them long-term, as you can imagine, no one knows that answer yet. Um, and I think studies will show that in the future. Thank you, Dr. Agnihotri. Thank you for joining us. We hope this information has been helpful and informative. To register for other post-COVID lunch and learns or to view a recording of today's session, along with the Q&A, visit uabmedicine.org forward slash post-COVID. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.